Good morning and a very warm welcome to our virtual English service. Given the current scenario in our nation and across the world, we find ourselves seeing one another across a monitor or a screen here this morning. I never thought that I would ever say we need to give a virtual high five to someone, you know? I always made fun of Facebook virtual handshakes and here we are, you know, hoping that we can give someone a virtual hand, high five and a, and a hello. We're so glad you're joining us and I know the next hour is going to be absolutely a great blessing to you. Uh, we have some great stuff we're going to be doing here together as well. Uh, first, we're going to get our, our worship team to sing. You know, obviously it's not a performance like we said. We want every one of you who are joining us today to join us in singing, honoring, and lifting up the name of Jesus wherever you are. And the promise that Jesus gave is when two people or three people are gathered together anywhere, in their midst I shall make my presence manifest. So go grab your Bible, all right? Go find your Bible in your bookshelf or wherever you've hidden it for a long time. Get a hold of it and grab it and keep it ready because we're going to study the Word of God as well. But before that, we're going to spend some time in worship and uh, honoring God. So join the team as we, as we sing. God is greater in our lives. Amen. In minds of different situations, God has kept us here alive, standing as a testament. Amen. Let's just worship God singing how great is our God's song. The splendors of our King And clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice
up your name this morning how great are you oh God you're greater than anything that we can see you're greater than anything that we can experience you are truly God Almighty the one who is above all things all authority all power belongs to you oh God you are great we lift up the name of Jesus Christ here today Lord you are uncontainable you are all powerful lord even though today we are meeting in different homes and we're gathering in different places there is no limit to your power your power and your presence is absolutely available for every single person who is joining us this very moment the power of god to touch their lives 
the power of God to transform their situations. We thank you that it is available this very moment. Lord, we thank you for mighty things that you're doing in the lives of your people here, Lord God. Lord, as your children, Lord, we take this moment to specially pray for our nation, the nation of India, and the whole world as well, Lord. Lord, we pray especially for the leaders of our nation. Give wisdom to those who are in governance, that they will do the right things to be able to bring this under control. This entire epidemic, I pray that you'll put wise, good leaders who will bring and, and direct this nation to safety. But Lord, we know there is someone greater than our leaders, it is you. So we lift up our eyes to our God, where our help comes from, and we ask God, have mercy upon our nation. Have mercy upon the nation of India. And we ask that this epidemic will stop in the name of Jesus. The spread of this virus will stop in the name of Jesus. We pray for the families. We pray for those who are affected, families who've lost their loved ones. We pray this very moment that the comfort and the peace of God will surround them. We pray that even in these darkest moments, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ will ring loud and clear in our nation that there is still hope in the name of Jesus. There's still salvation in the name of Jesus. And we pray that the hope of God will be revealed and established in our nation in these dark times, Lord God. As your children, we humble ourselves this morning at your feet. And we ask and we intercede and we beg for your mercy upon our people and upon our nation, O oh God. Lord, change the situation. I pray, Lord, that we will begin to move away from the situation and experience goodness and health and strength once again. We love you today. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In the very precious name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Come on, give God a good hand of praise for he is good. Hallelujah. Amen. Go ahead, take your seats. Here this morning, just a quick heads up on, you know, what's happening ahead of us this week. Obviously, all our church events and uh, extra meetings uh, stand canceled as of now for the rest of this week. Uh, we're keeping a close tab on the directives and guidelines that are being issued by the government uh, for our coming weekend. Uh, we're hoping that there will be a little bit more freedom for us to gather uh, physically. Uh, in any case, you can expect uh, a definite online presence uh, of our church uh, streaming as well for next Sunday. Uh, if you want to participate in giving uh, today, you can. Just look down at the lower third of your screen. Uh, our guys will put up some information about how you can give through NEFT or bank, bank transfer or look down the comments page. They'll give you a link as well on how you can uh, participate in honoring God through your giving as well. Yeah? Well, I'm delighted to be able to uh, share with you God's Word. Um, I'm, I basically want to continue my message uh, on the same title as last week. Uh, I began a, a message called The Fearless Life. And, uh, and we meditated on the infamous Psalm 91 and how it speaks comfort and hope to us at, at, at this time. So this morning I want to talk about uh, the fearless life, but under the subtitle, The Reason Why a Child of God Does Not Have to Fear. You know, reasons why a child of God does not have to fear. Um, this situation uh, around the world is grim. Developed and leading nations of our world are reeling under this epidemic that has brought um, the world to a standstill as we know it and some unprecedented decisions and steps that are being taken to try to control uh, the spread of this virus. No one knows yet what the impact of this epidemic would be upon the travel industry, the tourism industry, the airline industry, the manufacturing industry, the world economy. There's so many things that it's up in the air as to what's going to happen. Uh, what's becoming clear is that these events unfolding in front of our eyes will certainly have a lasting impact upon the world that we live in in the days to come. We're going to feel it as well. Um, but I want to remind you, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. We have a Heavenly Father who specializes in working in bleak and dark situations. That's who our God is, a God who operates 
in, in times of hopelessness and times of crisis. You know, right at the beginning of the Bible, the word of God mentions in Genesis chapter one, verse, verse uh, in Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says the earth was formless and empty and the darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Does that sound familiar to what we're seeing today in our world, chaos, a sense of emptiness, darkness, and uncertainty. And I love God's response to darkness and emptiness. You know what's God's response? And that's what I want to remind you today. In the midst of the darkness, in the midst of confusion and chaos, the thundering voice of God was heard, and the Bible records in verse 3, and God said, let there be light, he said. Today, I want to invite you to experience the God who is able to bring light to a dark and dying world. In the midst of hopelessness, the one true eternal light is our heavenly Father. And James says he is a Father of light in whom there is no shadow or variation of turning, which means he is always at his brightest. So our God is our hope. Come on, someone. Our God is our refuge. Our God is the one who is worthy to be trusted in him. We can find peace in the midst of chaos. In him, we can find a future in the midst of hopelessness. God said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the one who does not change. If there's one thing that is stable, that is certain at these uncertain times, it is our rock, our God, who does not change. And I want you to shift your attention from what you're seeing to the God who does not change. Because that's what the enemy wants us to do is to really, you know, confuse us by putting fear in our hearts, by looking around and, and, and looking at things when we're supposed to be looking towards the one who does not change, the one who is eternal, the one who is constant. You know, I love what the psalmist sings in Psalm 27, verse 1 onwards. This is what the psalmist sings. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from darkness. So why should I tremble? And then verse 5, he says, for he will conceal me there when trouble comes. Where's there? He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Come on, lift your hands with me and say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I don't have to be afraid. The Lord is my fortress protecting me from all danger. That's our hope. That's our incredible confidence. Now, I want to take the next few moments and give you um, three reasons why a Christian does not need to fear in these times. Three reasons why, you know, if you, if you love Jesus, if you follow Jesus, there are three very strong, convincing reasons why you should get up and, and jump and rejoice because of the promises that God is giving you. Here's number one. Here's my first reason why a Christian should not be afraid. We know how the story ends. And God will always prevail. And God's will also prevails. Yeah? Growing up, I really enjoyed reading detective mysteries and crime-solving novels, you know? And coming into summer vacation, I would have a list of books that I would, you know, want to read. And sometimes I was very ambitious. I would have several volumes of a certain mystery that I wanted to get through uh, during my summer vacation. And as I could see the school reopening day fast approaching and the pile of wonderful books I still wanted to read, I started to employ a new strategy on how I would read them. So basically what I did was the closer the days were coming, I would pick up a novel and I would read the first chapter. And normally, in all storybooks, the first chapter deals with the crisis. What's wrong? Someone got murdered, or someone went missing, or this huge catastrophe happened. That's what chapter one always is talking about. And then after reading first chapter, I would kind of skip through to the last chapter, and I'll read the last chapter, and, and I know everything is solved, everything is at peace, and they lived happily ever after. 
I had a sense of, oh, yes, that's, that's good. Everything got sorted out. The mystery was solved. And they call it the spoiler alert. That's what they, they call it, the spoiler alert, meaning if you read this, then you will not be surprised at how things turn out. That's what they say. You know, if you're reading through some reviews about certain movies, they say, spoiler alert, don't read the rest of this paragraph because if you read it, you will know how the movie ends. And, and I tell you, for a Christian, the Bible is a spoiler alert. <laughs> if you read the Bible and understand what it says, if you read chapter one, Genesis, you see the problem, sin entered, you know, the book first couple of chapters, sin entered, there was a crisis, and then you go to the last book, Revelation, Everything's okay. The people of God lived happily ever after for everlasting to everlasting to everlasting. Come on, someone. The Bible already gives us a hope about how things are going to turn out. And this is what it is. It's a reminder for you and I that regardless of what we see, what we experience in this world today, it does not matter. You and I know how this is all going to end. And God did not choose to reveal all the sub points or the plot points, but he did one thing. He revealed that at the end, Jesus wins, our hope is secure, and no matter how dark our days may be, God will prevail in all situations as well. And that's what we tell ourselves. We tell other people, do not be afraid. We know how it's going to end. We know how everything is going to be wrapped up because God already told us what to expect as well. You know, all that we see today um, is going to end one day. That's the reality. All that we see today is going to end one day. And I think people are kind of getting a better grasp of, of the uncertainty or the fragility of life today more than any other time or generation, you know, that ever lived. And, and the world, that, as we know it, is going to come to an end. Regardless of how, if someone saves the ice caps or not, regardless if you're not going to drive a, a petrol-driven vehicle or not, I tell you, I have bad news for you, the world is still going to end. You know, that's just what it is. That's, that's the hard fact. The world is going to end. Listen to this passage, Romans chapter 8, verse 18 onwards. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And I love this verse. He says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, against who its will, against its will, creation was subjected to God's curse, meaning the earth did not really want to be under curse, but thank you, Adam, thank you, Eve, the God under curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up until the present time. And we as believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit with us as a foretaste of the future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he promised us, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Say confidently with me. Confidently. So the next time you hear someone groan, don't get upset with them. They're doing something very biblical. So... Wives, when your husband groans when he gets up off the couch, it's okay. You know, don't, don't yell at him. He's doing a very biblical thing. The Bible says all creation groans in pain. You know, we're longing for the day when we will be released from sin and suffering. A day is coming where every child of God will get their full rights. That's what the Bible says, full rights as a son, as a daughter. We get a new body as we were promised, and it's going to be a glorious day. So whatever we're going through today is only for a moment, and it will soon pass away. Amen. All this heartache, pain, suffering that the devil brought into this world as a result of man's sin is going to end one day. Amen. You know, guys, what we're seeing today is a, res is a result of the sin that was, you know, allowed into this world, you know, when man sinned. And today, the epidemic you see, this incredible virus that's out of control, is a fruit of that sin. 
And there's, that's why it's there. But I tell you, there's this amazing thing. Like I told you, we know how the story ends. I love to read the book of Revelation because God kind of goes into detail, I think for the benefit of his saints, to tell us what he's about to do with the guy who's responsible for all of this. Do you want to know what's going to happen? You know, some of us, we kind of blame people or countries, and no one's to blame here right now for this virus. Okay, let's, not, let's stop pointing fingers. There's one person we need to point the finger towards. That's the age-old enemy of, of mankind, the devil, who has been wreaking havoc. And God is saying in Revelation, listen to this, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, and the Bible says, Then I saw an angel come down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He sees the dragon. That old serpent, who is the devil, you know, Satan, and bound him in chains. And I like to jump to verse 10, and the verse 10 says, Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. God says, guys, that's what's going to happen. When the time comes to an end, all the curses and all the heartache and the pain, the one who was responsible for it is going to receive what's going to come to him. And this is my favorite part of the book of Revelation, you know, Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4. And it says, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Amen. And verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain all these things are gone forever. I don't know about you, but I get excited when I read Revelation because I know what is to look forward to. I know what it is to look forward to for the future. So take courage today. Regardless of what you're seeing and what you hear being told to you over the media and over the news, in a few moments, it'll all soon pass away. But those who put their trust in Jesus will have a very secure future to look forward to. We don't have to fear. That's what the Bible says. If God is for us, then no one, nothing can stand against us. And that's the hope that we have. You know, for, for a Christ follower, we do not give in to fear. We give in to hope and faith in our God as well. Here's the second thing I want to give you, the second reason why a Christian should not fear. Because our refuge and protection are found in God. Our refuge and protection are found in God. Most of us who are hearing me today already know these truths. But, you know, it's important to be reminded these amazing promises during times of crisis. Worry is not our friend. Panic is not our way. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs 24, verse 10, it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is very small. May it never be said that God's people are governed more by fear than by faith. Yeah? It is in these moments of crisis, we as children of God have an amazing opportunity to testify the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. When everyone else is ruled by fear of the unknown, a child of God needs to stand strong and shine bright as a beacon of hope to those who are lost and say, this is the way, come back to God. Corey Ten Boon, um, who was a, uh, a woman of great courage and strength, who endured years of oppression and torture in the hands of the Nazi regime um, during World War uh, II, she said this, she said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows, it empties today of its strength. Yeah, that's what she said. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows, it empties today of its strength. So in times of crisis, the world needs steady people. Come on, say steady people who are strengthened by God's grace and are selfless in doing things for God as well. Worry accomplish, accomplishes nothing except giving birth to fear and to inaction. But faith produces action. Faith produces forward movement as well. You know, it's important that we remain alert against disease and sickness and applying common sense, you know, in how we, you know, protect our hygiene or how we interact with people. But I would, I would say that it won't help us fight off illness uh, or move us to action by worrying about something. 
sitting at home and worrying, oh, what if I get sick? What if this happens? Is not going to do anything for you. The Word of God actually teaches us uh, a replacement for worry as well. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So two words used there. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. So I would say the most important and the most useful thing a child of God can do at this very moment is to intercede and pray on behalf of the thousands who are sick and perishing in our nation and across the world as well. There are several examples in the Bible where, where God shortened His judgment or God shortened His action because people prayed on behalf of the dying people. And, and you've got to remind yourself, it takes the same amount of energy to worry as it does to pray. So what are you going to do? You know, prayer produces something, worry doesn't produce anything. So for a child of God, this is one of those moments where we need to really get on our knees and pray. You know, if they've given you time off of work, if they've given you time off of college, say, oh, good, I'm just going to relax. I'm going to catch up to everything I've missed, all my TV shows. You've really got yourself mixed up on what it is to be a child of God. As a child of God, this is the moment where you are called to stand. This is the moment where you're called to stand on behalf and pray, intercede, and ask God to stop what is going on and bring mercy and grace upon our nation as well. It's a time for Christians to pray. It's a time for Christians to intercede. This morning, after you've listened to what I'm talking about this morning, get on your knees and pray, God, in the community that I'm living in, the apartment complex that I'm living in, protect the people. Bring your, your grace and mercy upon our state, upon our nation. We do not want to see people die. We want them to experience God's salvation. So when we intercede as Christians, that's what God wants us to do in these moments of crisis as well. We can run to our God in times of crisis and find hope and shelter. And He is the anchor in the storm. Yeah? He is the rock of all ages. The Bible says He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning He is one person who is going to remain unchanged in this moments of uncertainty. You know, Psalmist sings in, in Psalm 46, verse 1 onwards, and he says these amazing words. He says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come, the mountains crumble into the sea, or the coronavirus comes down. Yeah? <laughs> Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. The guy, the, guy, the psalmist, is just going on to paint this picture of this, this really great storm. And then he says, don't worry. Because God is our strength, our refuge, our very present help in times of trouble. So today, I'm inviting you to come sit down at the amazing shadow of the Almighty God. Find rest. Find rest peace and hope in God. He is the one person that is worthy of all our hope. Do not fear and do not let anxiety grab hold of you. If you've got news about someone who's close to you who's somehow diagnosed with something or a relative of yours who's diagnosed with something, don't allow fear to conquer your hearts. Just uh, commit it to God in prayer like Philippians 4, 6 says, God, please preserve their life. Begin intercession. Begin praying for their life to be extended and God will do miracles on your behalf when you pray a prayer of faith as well. So that's what we do as children of God. The reason we don't fear is because God is our refuge and our hope. Here's number three. The reason we don't have to fear is because death is only an interlude. It is not the end. Yeah? Death is only an interlude. It is not the end. You know, um, there was a little boy um, who had a little cat, a four-year-old kid who had a little cat, and uh, one day when he was um, gone to kindergarten, um, unfortunately, the cat got run over by the neighbor's car. And the mother was in great panic because she didn't know how to break the news to her four-year-old kid about the death of 
of his cat. And all the kid comes back and says, Mommy, where's, you know, little Prissy or the cat? And Mom looks very sad and, and said, you know, Oh, uh, little Johnny, your cat died today. Uh, and the boy was shocked. He's like, what happened? Why did it die? And Mom said, don't worry, don't worry. The cat is with Jesus right now. And the boy looked at Mom a little strangely and says, why would Jesus want a dead cat? <laughs> was his biggest confusion, you know. Um, the underlying reason why people are so fearful of the COVID-19 is not because they're afraid of this bad cold or, or a cough. The most terrifying thing for most people is a prospect of death. That's pretty much what it is in our world. The mortality rate of mankind is 100%. Let me clarify what I'm saying, meaning none of us can escape death here on earth. It has always been 100% and will always be 100%. If you were born, you're going to die someday. Hebrews 9.27 says that. It says, it is appointed for man to die once. That's what the Bible says. It's appointed, you know. So nudge someone if you're sitting next to someone on your couch. Say, it's appointed, you know. But God has already had an appointment. I know it's terrifying for some of us, but that is the truth. And you'll have confidence by the time I'm done with sharing this point, all right, if you're afraid right now. The reality of death has not changed. What's changed over the last several weeks, at least for some of us, is that more people are consciously aware of this terrifying prospect of death because it's so close to their door. That's why they're terrified, you know. Most of the world would find this hard to believe, but this COVID-19 is a divine warning. That's what it is today. It is a divine warning of God. But the Lord of heaven, who governs every germ and every molecule in the universe, says to anyone who has ears to hear, I love you. I want you to come to me. That's what God is saying to you this morning. I know sometimes people like to point their fingers at God and say, he's responsible. Why did God allow this? But I tell you, God, who is rich in mercy, allows certain things to get people to come back to him to experience this incredible salvation. You know, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse, verse 28. He said this. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, Jesus was saying, guys, I, you know, don't, don't be afraid of, 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 of those who kill the body. There's something greater than death you've got to be afraid of. Someone who could, you know, keep you in eternal death. That's what you've got to be afraid of. But he didn't stop with that warning. In the next few verses, he also gives a promise. You know, in the next few verses, God, Jesus says, 29 onwards, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. For some of you, it's easy for God to keep account. For some of you, it's not. Um, fear not, therefore. Come on. Fear not, therefore. You are, more, you, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, you know, God values your life. And don't think for a moment that God has abandoned you or forsaken you or forsaken his people. God loves his children. While the World Health Organization races to find cures for the COVID-19, your Father in heaven is attending to every hair on your head. He rules over a worldwide pandemic and still cares for you. And if you and I die, you know, it's not because God stopped loving us. That's not the reason, you know. God loves us regardless of what happens in this world. For every Christian, this time of crisis that the world is facing today is an opportunity for us to shine bright the hope that is found in Christ Jesus. That's what it is, church. This is the moment that you can shine bright when everyone is gripped by fear when you are gripped by faith and confidence, you will stand out everywhere you go because there's something about someone who walks in courage and confidence in these moments. And all of us who are living here on this earth came into this earth through natural birth. We all have a day and a time where we physically entered this world. You know, that's what we call the birthday. 
But Jesus, when he was here on earth, he talked about a second birth called born again. And like many of us um, who cannot wrap our, our minds around what it means to have a second birth, there was a Jewish leader who had the same question like you and I did because then he kind of approached Jesus in the middle of the night and said, Jesus, I just can't understand what you're saying about this second birth. Would you please explain to me what you're talking about, this concept of being born again? Then Jesus sits him down patiently, and I want you to pay attention to this conversation that he had with this guy uh, called Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 4 onwards. This is the question that Nicodemus had. He said, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. How can they be born? So then he's trying to rationalize this whole concept of born, born again. He says, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Some of you are reading this like, it's still cryptic. I can't understand it. Let me break it down here. So Jesus explained to Nicodemus, and he's saying, the second birth is a spiritual birth. That's what he's saying that a person can experience through their faith and their outward commitment of water baptism. Jesus made it very clear that no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they experience this second birth, the born again. So I kind of, you know, put it in this way. I would say every person has the option of experiencing two births and one death, or one birth and two deaths. Let me try to break it down for you. Yeah? When you choose the experience of the second birth, which is the spiritual birth, the only death that you will experience is a natural death. And after the natural death, there is a gift of eternal life that is promised where you will spend the rest of eternity in the very presence of God and you will be with him for eternity. That's what Jesus said. Now, but if you choose to ignore this option of the second birth here while on earth, what happens is you will have to experience two deaths. One is the natural death that I told you that every person is appointed to experience while on earth, the death. But then the second death is far more horrifying for me to even describe. This death is a death where it is, the Bible talks about an eternal separation from God, where it is death in suspending motion, where you are constantly experiencing death and you can never return back from it. I don't know about you, but I want to choose two birds and have one death. Because it's so much better to have, you know, death itself is horrible. And I'm not saying death is not horrible. It is horrible. But Jesus promised for anyone who receives him as the Lord and Savior has to experience death only once and have eternal life. Listen to this scripture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 onwards. The Bible says, at uh, 53, the Bible says, For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. Through Jesus Christ, there is a victory that is given over death. And, and the writer says, then we say, where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, oh, grave is your victory. In other words, Jesus took the sting of death. It no longer is a curse for us anymore because death is just an interlude. It's a pause. It's like an interval for us. And we're going to take a break and we're going to come back. But when we come back, the Bible says in a brand new body, in a brand new world, and the amazing things that God has in store for his children are beyond our imagination and comprehension. Jesus 
took the sting of death. 2,000 years ago, when he hung on the cross, he took the sting of coronavirus just as much. Amen. By his stripes, we were healed, the Bible says. For every child of God, this is the greatest hope. Whether we live or whether we die, it's still going to be great because we have a God who always is eternally faithful to his children. And I tell you, as you see uncertainty and fear all around us in our communities, in our world, and you open up the paper in the morning and it talks about this person dying and that person got, you know, this virus and this happened here and this being shut down. Make no mistake that in the midst of all of this, there is a loving Heavenly Father who so much desires for you to know that He loves you and wants to redeem your life through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ, that was done on the cross 2,000 years ago. This very moment, you can experience this incredible spiritual second birth that Jesus is talking about. It says, to anyone who believes with their heart, confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, to them God gives the amazing gift of salvation. Today, seated on your couch, seated wherever you are, you can experience this amazing gift of salvation and new birth in your life where God can absolutely cleanse you of your past and give you a brand new beginning. And anyone who receives this gift of salvation that Christ gives freely can begin the fearless life. Yes. Where we're not ruled by fear, we're not ruled by what happens in our circumstances, we're ruled by the Spirit of God that is in us who testifies of the great promise that we have in and through Jesus Christ. Yes. This morning I want to encourage you I want to I tell you it's going to be okay. God is in control. He is still on the throne. He is sovereign. God has not lost control. He is a God who does not sleep nor slumber. He is always, always watchful of His children, you and me. And that's our hope and confidence that we have a God who is unshakable, unchanging, and eternal all the time. I want us to pray together. And we're going to pray that today, that God will fill our hearts with hope. And I, like I said, two things that Christ, a Christian can do at this time. Prayer, number one, you know, to pray and intercede for God to intervene in this situation. And number two, to share your confidence and hope in Jesus Christ. By acts of mercy, don't let fear dictate your action. Don't let fear, you know, cripple you from doing things you would normally do. God is with you. And no one can ever touch your life without God's permission. Did you know that? That's something we, we have a promise from God. God has already knows how long and how many hours and how many minutes you have. And no one can change that. No virus, no, no COVID-19 can shorten the time that God has for you. If God has a time, that's going to stay. And you can do what you need to do, which is share the hope of Jesus Christ to people and show mercy and comfort and tell people that God is with them and it's going to be okay. Help people. And, and share the hope that they have in Christ Jesus as well. Pray with me here today. We're going to get, you know, the worship team to come up in a, just a moment. I'm going to sing one more song as we wrap up. But we're going to pray a quick word of prayer. And we're going to ask God to touch us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is incredible hope in you today. I pray for every person who is listening to the sound of my voice this very moment. That the very hope of God will be situated in the heart in the center of their heart, that the rock of all ages is one who is worthy of dependence. And I pray that Jesus will be lifted high this very moment. Lord, even though everyone is still, and I pray in the stillness of this day, let us hear the voice of God. Let there be light. Let there be hope. Let there be great work of God established in the midst of darkness and chaos. Let the hope of God rule and reign over our nation, over the world today, O oh God. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. And I pray for anyone who is listening to me today, who has heard my message and wants to experience the second birth as they call upon your name, Jesus. I pray, and as they confess their sins and their need for you, that thank you that you forgive them. Thank you that you give them a brand new life. And thank you for the salvation that you give as an incredible gift when we ask of you. We love you and we honor you. In the very precious name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise for he is good. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We'll have one more song. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious Lord, Lord to give. Once again, we give you thanks, Lord, for the time that we've had together today. We lift up your name, we honor it, and we give you praise and thanks for hearing our prayer today, for doing mighty things in our nation, and Lord, for bringing a, a, an end to this chaos that we see. We give you thanks in advance for the peace of God that will rule over our nation, Lord God. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. We'll give Jesus one more round of applause for his good. Amen. Amen. Have a great and restful morning filled with the joy of God. And don't forget, pray for the nation of India today. Be blessed. Amen.